I, I think we're uh, we're here. So welcome. My name is Johns with Baltimore Heritage. Uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, this is uh, part of our series uh, Friday afternoon uh, talks that we've been doing with the Baltimore Architecture Foundation uh, for, gosh, I guess since the beginning of COVID. So going on three years now. Um, if you made a voluntary contribution today, thank you so much. We are both small organizations and this uh, uh, literally keeps us afloat. So uh, we say thank you, thank you. Um, before introducing today's speaker, let me uh, just say we've got a couple more talks uh, uh, lined up already for the spring. One on April 28th, um, uh, Baltimore's Road Wars. If you uh, if you have gotten the book on it, uh, fantastic. Uh, if you haven't, uh, this maybe this is like uh, the crib sheets for it, so you can uh, come uh, and learn uh, or even learn a little bit more. Uh, that's on April 28th, and then I think the next one on May 12th, uh, LGBTQ uh, Heritage um, with Richard Aloysia, uh, one of Baltimore Heritage's uh, uh, tour leaders. I think we're doing a tour uh, I'll have to get the exact date, but I know we're doing at least one LGBTQ heritage walking tour in person, uh, real life, uh, in uh, Charles Village. So stay tuned for that. Um, one more quick housekeeping thing is uh, we're going to uh, hear from uh, Dr. Martin here in a second. Uh, but if you have any questions, and we're going to definitely take some questions at the end, we're going to save them till the end. Uh, please put them in the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, uh, I will admit that I can't remember which box does what, So, but if you stick it in one of those two boxes, uh, we will get it, and uh, and then Dr. Martin uh, will will pose it to Dr. Martin. So um, fire away in the chat box or the Q and A box. All right. So Dr. Joanne Martin is our guest uh, today, um, and we are thrilled. I know I've been uh, going to her museum for a number of years. She founded the Great Blacks and Wax Museum uh, 30 years ago, I think, maybe even a little bit more than that, uh, with her husband. Um, it was uh, the first of its kind in the nation. So we're pretty, as we Baltimoreans brag about our firsts, uh, this is one we can put in that list. Um, Dr. Martin is not a one-woman show. She does have help uh, at the museum, but she kind of acts like she's a one-woman show uh, a lot of the time. She does research on the history for the exhibits. She curates the exhibits to make sure that they accur accurately reflect uh, what uh, our historical record um, can support. She uh, helps lead the museum's education mission, uh, and she raises money for, uh, for all of this to happen. So she does have help. But sometimes uh, it's, uh, it seems that she is a one one woman band. Um, the way today today's talk is going to be a little bit different uh, than some others that we've done. Uh, uh, we are going to show a short little uh, video clip. I think it's about ten or ten or fifteen minutes, maybe, uh, that it was uh, Dr. Martin put together. Excuse me, uh, specifically for this uh, uh, exhibit that's going on, being literate, being free. Uh, so we're going to take a, 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 a we're going to watch that, uh, and then Dr. Martin, who is uh, who is here with us, uh, we've got her successfully on the line. Um, uh, we're going to turn it over to her uh, to maybe uh, talk about it and definitely answer questions uh, about either this exhibit, about the Great Blacks and Wax Museum, uh, about any of that. So uh, Molly, my colleague Molly, is uh, our technical guru. Molly, I think we are ready uh, to. Um, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do my old-fashioned finger crossing that the technology works, but I think we're ready for the video. Okay, I'm gonna share now. Okay. From Dr. Elmer Martin of the everyone, I'm Dr. Joanne Martin founder along with my late husband, Dr. Elmer Martin of the National Great Blacks in Wax Museum. I am so proud to be a part of the Virtual Histories series of programming and so thankful to Baltimore Architecture Foundation and Baltimore Heritage for giving me the opportunity to present to you the theme, Being Literate, Being Free. Please enjoy.
our presentation around the theme, Being Literate, Being Free. The theme advances the idea and the knowledge that for many African uh, people who were enslaved and for many of the, of the people who fought against slavery, there was an understanding that being literate, the ability to read, write, gain, and use information could be a pathway to freedom. And I'm going to take you on a tour where we focus upon those individuals, those historical personalities who understood that being literate meant being free. I'm standing here before the man in the iron mask. This figure represents the harshness and cruelty of slavery and the ability to control. This man in the iron mask um, has the mask on his face. Um, it's fastened uh, in the back and then fastened again. There were just enough holes in it for him to be able to breathe, but he could not eat or drink. So the idea was that he would starve to death if he did not give in. And to add to the punishment, more weights could be added here. Um, a weight pulling down on his slowly starving body here. But in regard to the whole notion of being literate, um, literacy, the teaching of and learning to read and write uh, was a dangerous thing. And um, there were uh, laws against it. There were laws that said that um, re if you learn to read, uh, you could have one finger cut off. If you learn to write, you could have two fingers cut off because writing was considered the most uh, dangerous of those efforts to become literate. You could write a pass for yourself or for someone running away. And therefore, the punishment of maiming a person, a slave who learned to read or to write and, and to write. Um, so we have here this figure uh, representing that of having two fingers cut off. I tell children who come to the museum that there must have been something very dangerous um, about learning to read and write if someone would take that kind of punishment against you, that kind of cruelty against you. And therefore, we want them to appreciate that we desire for them to become literate. Uh, and we see it also as a pathway to their freedom to be educated, to be learned, and to make a difference in this world. Mother Mary Elizabeth Lang definitely had a respect for literacy. She is, along with founding the Oblate Sisters of Providence, the oldest order of black nuns in this country. Mother Lang also started a school, St. Francis Academy, for poor black children. She wanted them to become literate. She understood the power of literacy and spent her life along with the other nuns of the order fighting to see to it that education was a way for those children, many of them poor, to become literate and therefore to become free. Frederick Douglass said that once he became literate, he felt the trump of freedom, the silver trump of freedom. Frederick Douglass um, was a slave. He was enslaved on a plantation here in Maryland. And he wanted to learn to read and write. He would find himself with his, uh, when his uh, slave mistress, the, uh, the white slave woman who owned him, she would be teaching her young son his lessons. And Frederick Douglass would sneak in, try to uh, be inconspicuous, and be very quiet, and he would listen. 
And one day his slave mistress said to him, Frederick, you don't have to stand back there. Um, come in and, and join us and learn with us. And so Frederick Douglass from then on, whenever his slave mistress would uh, work with her son, teaching him to read and to write, Frederick Douglass would be a part of the group. But that was a dangerous thing. That was a criminal offense for his slave mistress. Teaching a slave to read or to write could get her fined and jailed. And for Frederick Douglass, it could get him killed. But Frederick Douglass understood the power of the written word the power of education and the power to gain literacy as a course of gaining freedom. Thaddeus Stevens uh, was from Massachusetts. He grew up poor and he said that powerful, rich white men saw it as their duty to keep people poor and therefore to take away their equality. Thaddeus Stevens um, was able to overcome so much of that. He was able to get funding to go to school. He was able to get funding to uh, go uh, and become a lawyer. Um, and, as, and once he became a lawyer, he also ran for office and became a representative first of the Pennsylvania um, House of Representatives, and then finally the United States House of Representatives. Thaddeus Stevens war, uh, fought very hard to bring freedom and equality and rights to the former slaves. He was against slavery, and therefore he fought along with Charles Sumner to get the rights to be a full-fledged citizen of the United States, a full-fledged equal participant in the United States. That is Stevens fought because he understood that being literate being, meant being free. That is Stevens engaged in his fight for freedom for the former slaves and for free people who had lived under uh, the yoke of slavery. Um, he fought along with his uh, companion, his good friend, Charles Sumner. Charles Sumner um, was so hated by uh, the Southern Dixiecrats, as they were called, the Democrats from the South who were very much pro-slavery, that one of um, the people uh, uh, in the House of Representatives in the U.S. House of Representatives, beat him to the floor with a cane. He was beaten so badly that he almost died. He was in a coma for months, and it took uh, more than a year for him to recover. But like Thaddeus Stevens, he felt that he had to fight for the rights of the newly freed slaves and those slaves who, those free slaves who had, those free people who had lived uh, in slavery. And so he and Thaddeus Stevens passed some of the first civil rights legislation in the nation because they understood that being literate, giving um, the opportunity for all children to get a free public education that was one of their causes, especially Thaddeus Stevens. They knew that having an education, being literate, being able to read and write was a pathway to freedom. Here we have Mary McLeod Bethune from Florida. She started a school in Daytona Beach, Florida. The school was Bethune-Cookman College now Bethune-Cookman University, still existing in Daytona Beach. And Mary McLeod Bethune 
understood that black children needed to have the opportunity to get an education. She started a, a smaller school and just in getting her school off the ground, um, she raised the money uh, for that school. She would sell sweet potato pies and, and all kinds of uh, uh, grassroots fundraisers to be able to help um, children get an education and eventually to succeed in her dream of building a school where that has educated thousands and thousands and thousands of children throughout the ages. Mary McLeod Bethune, who understood the power of reading and writing and having the opportunity to get an education. Booker T. Washington was so impassioned about education that he and his students uh, in Tuskegee, Alabama, not only did Booker T. build um, the Tuskegee uh, Institute, but it was built um, by him and his students making the bricks that went into the building of that school. He understood and dedicated his life to educating black children. He, as a part of that effort, recruited the person standing next to him, George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver is referred by many young children as the peanut man because he took his knowledge of agriculture, of things like crop rotation, uh, to save a bankrupt South, a South that was, um, that was, uh, saw itself going bankrupt, um, Southern farmers, because they relied on the peanut, um, I'm sorry, because they relied on cotton and tobacco. Uh, it was George Washington Carver who taught them to diversify and therefore to use and grow peanuts, and eventually soybeans and yams, and to learn to make different products like peanut oil and um, soy oil and so forth from those products. George Washington Carver was also someone who was in the battle for to fight uh, fossil fuels and climate change. So he's very relevant today. He um, taught and worked with Henry Ford to create a soy-based fuel for the um, Ford Model T. He did the same thing uh, with Mr. Diesel with the diesel engine. So when we look at George Washington Carver, we understand that he, along with Booker T. Washington, had such a tremendous appreciation and dedication to gaining the right to read, the right to write, the right to be educated for black children. Here beside me is James Belden Johnson from Jacksonville, Florida. He um, was a principal of a school in Jacksonville. He went on to get uh, a, an advanced degree from Columbia University. Um, he was a poet, a songwriter, and a writer. He and his brother, Rosamond Johnson, wrote over 200 songs, and the most famous of which is the one called Lift Every Voice and Sing. So popular was it, so moving were the words that it became known as Negro National Anthem and now the Black National Anthem, African American National Anthem. He had such an appreciation for the written word, such an appreciation for the spoken word such an appreciation of the fact that the word could lift. It could lift as we climbed. It could lift as we sought to be free. It could lift as we sought to face the rising sun for a new day begun. James Weldon Johnson, a man who understood that being literate meant being free. Uh, 
All right, I think we're 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 back live time. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Martin. I am glad that um, we got to not only hear you but get a peek inside the Great Blacks and Wax Museum in the process. Um, I'm going to uh, reiterate: if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the Q and A box. Um, I think that I'm not. Oh, or the chat box. It looks like we have um, uh, maybe no, nope, not yet in the chat box. Let, let me let me ask one thing while we kind of get warmed up here, Dr. Martin. I have about 50 questions, but maybe if we could sort of start back at the start, the idea of memorializing great Black Americans in wax, putting them, uh, creating a museum on North Avenue and uh, and showcasing them. Where did where did that come from, and how did that get started? Do you mind just uh, uh, for the, for some of us who sheepishly haven't been there in about eight years, and maybe some folks have not been there, but um, maybe just if you could take a minute or two and share how the how the dream got started. Um, uh, for me and and for my late husband Elmer, it starts uh, when Elmer sponsored a little league baseball team of uh, Baltimore City. Baltimore City. Um, children had ID pictures taken of them so that they could play in the league. And one little kid came with the picture. He was angry, demanded that Elmer make the photographer take the picture over saying, they got me too black in this picture. I don't want to be as black as they got me in this picture. And that was so shocking and disappointing to my um, husband, Elmer, who was a part of the Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud generation, the Black is Beautiful generation, and the generation that declared ourselves Black and uh, and no longer Negro and colored. So um, the journey goes through several routes, but ending up in um, Potter's Wax Museum in St. Augustine, where we really, it hit us the power of those wax figures and the wax figure medium to perhaps uh, put a face on a history that's been faceless, to, um, uh, to um, shine a light on a history that, that's been denied and, uh, and neglected. And, and therefore that um, we uh, started looking around and, and uh, uh, eventually had four wax figures that we had as a traveling exhibit. We'd put them in the hatchback of my car and take them home with us to our two bedroom apartment and all of that, um, but opened up um, after our traveling exhibit um, uh, called the Martin's Wax Exhibition of Great Afro-Americans. Um, we moved into um, a storefront in downtown Baltimore and then eventually to North Avenue where we are now. Oh, excellent. So all started with a with a with a young baseball player, huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Maybe um, now a member of the Oreos. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're starting to get some questions. Um, here's one. Uh, were the enslaved people first brought here able to read and write themselves? Do you know that? Um, some of them were. Um uh, you you had people from um, various backgrounds, and um, some of them from very privileged backgrounds um, uh, in, in, in terms of um, uh, raw, uh, being a part of um, African royalty and so forth. Um, but uh, many of them were not, and, and also, even if they were, they weren't um, uh, uh, literate uh, in English. And um, uh, one of the um, schemes was to make sure that you didn't uh, you didn't allow them to be able to communicate verbally uh, by making sure that you didn't uh, um, uh, bring them from diff the same tribal groups or same regions of the country where they spoke the same language. So this effort to cut off all communication and therefore control. Um, how they communicated and whether they communicated because uh, you had to be worried about whether they would um, conspire to rebel um, and, and so forth. All right, we've got another one here, Ida Wells Barnett, W.E.B. Du Bois, and this next one, I hope I pronounced right, right uh, Alada Aquiano, um, great writers, are they in the museum too? Um, we have um, Ida B. Wells um, and we have um, W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, we have a, um, uh, our uh, video um, where um, we have the words of um, um, Oladao uh, Equiana uh, and where he describes um, his, um, um, his experience uh, on the slave ship and what it was like being captured and, and so forth. So he definitely has a presence and, uh, and two of those that you mentioned are figures in our museum. 
Excellent. All right. Well, another one. Uh, uh, has the museum returned to the schedule that was in place prior to the pandemic? Are you are you back uh, back to pre pandemic normal? We um, we have not. Um, we are open. Uh, we were open uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, Tuesday through Saturday from nine to five and Sunday from noon to five. Um, today we're open uh, Thursday through Saturday, um, 10 to five and Sunday um, noon, noon to five. And um, by, um, by a, um, a, a special request an appointment um, if uh, those hours don't uh, work. Excellent. All right, we got uh, another one here. Uh, it says, when I think of Maryland's strong black history, I think of Thurgood Marshall, Benjamin Banneker, Harriet Tubman, Josiah Henson, uh, Frederick Douglass. Are, are they in the museum as well? I think we want to know. We want to know every single person that's in your museum, <laughs> Dr. Martin. We um, we don't have Josiah Henson. We have all of our, all of the others um, um, you mentioned. Excellent. Um, here, uh, they're, 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 keep rolling here. So if you can hang in there with us a little longer, that would be great. Are there are wax figures still being added to the museum? Um, and maybe if, if you don't mind talking about some of the uh, newest additions. Um, we we um, that definitely add to our collection um, all the time, um, and and some of the figures are remakes. We um, just did a, a new Colin Powell. Uh, for example, and he was, uh, if you flew anywhere in uh, February, Black History Month, and you would have seen him at uh, BWI uh, in the terminal, standing there with Mary McLeod Bethune and, uh, and in, in, our, in the air cargo, uh, we have uh, Mahalia Jackson. Um, we've, um, we are working on, I, I'm working with an organization, and, and right now I'm not free to um, to say who they are as we work things out, but they are um, black women um, who have made uh, their mark recently on recent history. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave it at, at that. And there are three of them uh, right now that we're um, looking at. Um, and we're in the midst of an expansion. So temporarily we will be relocating um, and uh, the exhibits, we will have special um, temporary exhibits as we um, take the money that we've received from people like um, the Congressman Kwaisi Mfume and our Senator uh, Corey McCray and Adrian um, Jones and so forth. That will allow us to expand the museum from 1601, the firehouse to 1611 um, and create about 25,000 additional um, feet of um, square feet of uh, space and so forth. I was gonna. I was gonna ask you uh, about that recent uh, good news, but uh, thank you for sharing. Um, we've got a few more. Um, one is: uh, Are there any uh, efforts to memorialize the location of the Nathaniel Knight Bookstore on Fame Street, where Frederick Douglass bought his copy of the Columbian Orator? Um, I don't know if that's uh, in your purview or not, but uh, do you have anything on that? Well, we uh, we don't, and I'm I'm not familiar with that history. So I, I'm I'm hoping that um, the uh, the person who answered the question will um, share that with me because it sounds like something that uh, definitely I need to know about, and um, will um, will definitely uh, uh, await uh, getting more information from him from him or her. I, I will I will admit I don't know anything about that either. So you and I will both try to find that out. Um, <laughs> Here's, here's one uh, uh, from somebody who is joining us from the United Kingdom and uh, uh, asks, is there a way to virtually visit your, uh, your museum? We have um, two uh, um, virtual um, tours, a kids tour and um, a middle school to um, college um, tour that we, uh, that we make available. And we're, we're looking at uh, more uh, digital presentations, but yes, um, uh, those two tours um, are available. And then we, um, some of the, like the Being Literate, Being Free, um, uh, or Healing Hearts and Hands, um, uh, Black Women Spies of the Civil War, those are also available um, virtually. And is that, uh, I'll just follow up, is that something we, uh, people can find, up, find out about on your website? Or how do, if somebody's interested, how do they, how do they figure out how to do it? Um, our website is being um, rebuilt, but and some of that information is uh, slowly making its um, its way um, there. 
but um, uh, you can uh, leave a question uh, on the website indicating and um, and it has information about how you can contact us and get access to those uh, virtual tools. Uh, okay, excellent. I hope everybody I heard that. I Go don't know how much time I have. And and, and um, there was a story uh, I didn't realize that we didn't include um, Mary Elizabeth Bowser, um, who was a union spy. And I really like to tell that story if I can. If, if, if not, then uh, some other time. You, you, but. You, you, you can't say black women spies in the Civil War and not <laughs> share the story, Dr. Martin. So, yes. Please, well, Mary, sorry, everybody, uh, for the question. Uh, we'll get to him in a second. A, but, uh. <laughs> Mary Bowser was a, um, a, uh, a, uh, an enslaved person in the home of the Van Loos. They were a Quaker family. Um, uh, when Mr. Van Lu died, uh, because the, the Quakers had embraced the notion that slavery was wrong, Mrs. Van Lu, the wife, and Miss Van Lu, the daughter, um, freed their slaves, and they sent Mary to um, to school, to the Quaker um, school for Negroes, um, to become literate. Uh, Miss Van Lu, the daughter, had a spy network, and so when Mary finished school, uh, Mary, uh, she recruited Mary for, for her spy network and had her um, placed in the Confederate White House of Jefferson Davis. Now, he didn't have enough respect for women in general, and certainly not for a Black woman, that this person could read and write. And so she was in what essentially was the Confederate war room, dusting and sweeping and reading and spying at, right under his nose. And then um, Miss Van Lu also placed uh, undercover someone who posed as, as a uh, baker, and he would stop by. His route was the Confederate White House, so he'd stop by to get the the orders for the rolls and crumpets and whatever. And Mary would go out, and she'd pass along the secrets that she had gained, and then it passed them along to Abraham Lincoln and the generals and the colonels and, and whatever. So you have these two women, two young women. One black, one white, um, Miss Van Lu and Mary Bowser, who played a significant role in uh, uh, winning the Civil War for the United States of America. Unbelievable! <laughs> that's just that's just wonderful. Unbelievable. Um, I, uh, I yeah yeah I'm not sure where to go from there because that's uh, that's just uh, that is a, a a great thing to think about on this gray Friday afternoon. Um, we do have just two, maybe two more questions, and we've tried to uh, make keep our pledge to stay close close to half an hour. Um, uh, there's another question about uh, uh, virtual tours. That I think we've answered. Um, here, here's one. Do you have a gift shop? There's a, a question for you. Um, the second floor. Uh, we're working on um, a part of the uh, renovation of the um, the firehouse, as it's affectionately known, but our 1601 building on the corner of North Avenue and Bond Street. Um, we closed that off because we had um, the, the floors are being reinforced, and we're doing some other kind of um, uh, uh, renovation. So uh, there is a gift shop up there, and and as soon as we finished um, that. Uh, it will be open uh, again. And we are trying to get started a, uh, a, an e-gift shop. And so we're, we're working with um, um, a few companies and so forth and looking at uh, how we might be able to get that done. I'm thinking of Mary Methum and her bake sales to found a college. So uh, sell those <laughs> sell those T-shirts and uh, coffee mugs or whatever you're selling. Go. All right, last um, last final question here. Um, is there a way if folks want to uh, just get your uh, latest news and new exhibits or programming? Is there a way uh, for them to stay in touch? We are uh, launching our um, um, our newsletter, um, and um, I'm told by the uh, the person who's guiding that effort that she expects to um, to do that by early April. So um, yes, all right, and we'll um, uh, uh, you can certainly go on uh, the Great Blacks of Wax website 
Uh, but you, if you have our email here at Baltimore Heritage, uh, we'll uh, we'll help when that gets up and running. We will be glad to help send out an announcement of that also. So you stay tuned twice, maybe, I guess. Um, all right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Martin. Um, uh, thank you, everybody, for hanging in there with us on Friday afternoon. Uh, hope to see you next time. And uh, and whether there's an active gift shop or not, uh, head on over to North Avenue and uh, check them out Thursday through Sunday, right? Right. Okay. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thank you all.